Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort, a local Champaign-Urbana peace group. I'm Carl Estabrook. We're recording this at midday on Tuesday, September 4th, in the studios of Urbana Public Television. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing in accord with the Latin proverb, proprium humane and geni est odissi quim laserus. It's human nature to hate those you have injured. The president is talking peace with North Korea and Russia, but American liberals and neocons within the administration are appalled that peace might break out because the profits of America's 1% depend upon the U.S. government's maintaining American economic control of the world. And the way they do it is by threats of war against Russia and China, their peer competitors, as they're called in the foreign policy business. You may have noticed when Trump and the leader of North Korea talk peace in Singapore, defense stocks, as they're called, it means weapon makers, declined sharply. So the U.S. is making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Mideast and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a weapon against its economic rivals from Germany and China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, although most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command are active in three quarters of the countries of the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. As the rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. today is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protect, don't know that protected as they are by government and media propaganda. What we do here at Aware on the Air is try to encourage our fellow citizens to become aware of the killing our government is doing around the world in our name. We're involved in great crimes and must stop. The U.S. is today setting the stage for a massive U.S. military attack in Syria to protect al-Qaeda and other terrorists in their last Syrian stronghold the northern Syrian city of Idlib. The U.S. is condemning and threatening the government of Syria for trying to seize control of all of Syria. Idlib is under the control of al-Qaeda, sorry, uh, Idlib is under the control of al-Qaeda and could be the last battle. The U.S. is present only illegally in Syria and is protecting terrorists and jihadists. The U.S. strategy in Syria has been described as creating quagmires until we get what we want. That's Jason Ditz at the excellent website antiwar.com. In seeking to control post-war Syria, the U.S. is determined to continue the war. In 2013, top Obama administration officials described their policy in the Syrian war as one of keeping the war going. The administration wanted a seat at the table for a political settlement, which officials clarified meant ensuring that the war kept on going so that there was never a clear victor. The Trump administration seems to be slipping into that same destructive set of priorities in Syria. The Washington Post this week quoted an unnamed administration official as saying that, quote, right now our job is helped to create quagmires for Russia and the Syria regime until we get what we want, close quote. That's the American position, and of course, the Americans are in Assyria illegally, while the Russians are there at the invitation of the legal Syrian government. As ever, what the U.S. really wants is to have a dominant position in post-war negotiations so they can dictate the form that post-war Syria takes. 
This means, this means ensuring that the Syrian government doesn't win the war outright. That's not as realistic as it once was, with the Assad government backed by Russia, having retaken virtually all the rebel-held territory, except for a far, more, far north bastion in Idlib, dominated by al-Qaeda. This means the U.S. now has to save al-Qaeda to keep the war going, which, if we're being honest, has been a recurring undercurrent in U.S. policy in Syria for years. Uh, much nonsense is spoken about 9-11 as a uh, Pearl Harbor that brought America into the Middle East. America was always in the Middle East, and it went into Syria by sending terrorists and jihadists uh, into that country in order to control uh, its uh, oil flows out of the Gulf. It is this desire that has the U.S. repeatedly threatening Syria and warning them not to attack Idlib. It is this desire that's sparking the most daily threats to intervene militarily if the Idlib offensive involves chemical weapons. Most importantly, it is this desire that has Russia very much believing media reports that the rebels could stage a fake chemical attack just to suck the U.S. into the war and be fairly confident it would work, because, of course, that's what the U.S. wants. The U.S. is, after all, constantly talking about an imminent chemical attack, despite there being no reason to think Syria is poised to launch one. At times, U.S. officials have privately conceded that there is no sign Syria is making any moves to, moves to even ready such weapons for the offensive. Yet several times a week, the U.S. issues statements with allegations of a chemical plot featuring prominently, setting the stage for a reaction. The Syrian war has been nearing its end game for months now, with Israeli officials conceding it is all but over, as far as they're concerned, while vowing not to honor any post-war deals. When a war is lost and a plan has failed, however, the U.S. government has often determined to drag the war on as long as possible. Uh, a paramount example in our lifetimes is, of course, Vietnam. Ron Paul, one of the few uh, major American political figures uh, who has talked since on American wars uh, for years, wrote this week, can't we just leave Syria alone? He says Assad, means President Assad of Syria, was supposed to be gone already. President Obama thought it would be just another regime change operation, and perhaps Assad would end up like Saddam Hussein of Iraq, or Yanukovych. Yanukovych was the president, the elected president of Ukraine that the Obama administration arranged to depose. Or maybe even Gaddafi, who was the leader of Libya, whom Hillary Clinton's State Department arranged to uh, depose and murder. But Assad was supposed to be gone. The U.S. spent billions to get rid of him and even provided weapons and training to the kinds of Islamic radicals that attacked the United States on 9-11 in order to go after uh, the president of Syria. But with the help of his allies, President Assad has nearly defeated this foreign-sponsored insurgency. The foreign sponsorship, of course, being that of the United States. The U.S. fought him every step of the way. Every time the Syrian military approached another occupied city or province, Washington and its obedient allies issued the usual warnings that Assad was not liberating territory, but was actually seeking to kill more of his own people. Remember Aleppo, where the U.S. claimed Assad was planning mass slaughter once he regained control? As usual, the neocons and the media were completely wrong. Even the U.N. has admitted that with Aleppo back in the hands of the Syrian government, hundreds of thousands of Syrians have actually moved back. We're supposed to believe they willingly return, they willingly return so that Assad could kill them? The truth is that Aleppo is being rebuilt. Christians celebrated Easter there this spring for the first time in years. There's been no slaughter once Al-Qaeda and ISIS hold was broken. Believe me, if there was a slaughter, we would have heard about it in the media. So now, with the Syrian military and its allies prepared to f liberate the final Syrian province of Idlib, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo again warns the Syrian government against retaking its own territory. He tweeted a fr on Friday that, 
quote, the three million Syrians who have already been forced out of their homes and are now in Idlib will suffer from this aggression. Not good. The world is watching, close quote. President, President Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, has also warned the Syrian government that the U.S. will attack if it uses gas in Idlib. Of course, that warning serves as an open invitation to rebels currently holding Idlib to set off another false flag and enjoy U.S. air support. Bolton and Pompeo are painting Idlib as a peaceful province resisting the violence of an Assad who they claim just enjoys killing his own people. But who controls Idlib province? President Trump's own special envoy for the global coalition to counter ISIS, Brett McGurk, said in Washington last year that, quote, Idlib province is the largest al-Qaeda safe haven since 9-11. Tied, to direct, tied directly to Ayman al-Zawahiri, this is a huge problem, close quote. Could someone please remind Papeo and Bolton that al-Qaeda are the bad guys? After six years of a foreign-backed regime change operation in Syria, backed by the U.S., where hundreds of thousands have been killed and the country nearly fell into the hands of ISIS and al-Qaeda, the Syrian government is on the verge of victory. Assad is hardly a saint, but does anyone really think al-Qaeda and ISIS are preferable? After all, how many Syrians fled the country when Assad was in charge versus when the U.S.-backed rebels started taking over? Far fewer in the first case, many more in the second. Americans should be outraged that Pompeo and Bolton are defending al-Qaeda in Idlib. It's time for the neocons to admit they lost. It's time to give Syria back to the Syrians. It's time to pull the U.S. troops from Syria. It's time to just leave Syria alone. So writes Ron Paul this week, one of the few voices of sanity on American foreign policy. In general, the press is full of pro-war propaganda. War is good for U.S. business. The U.S. uses war and war provocations to deter particularly the integration of Eurasia, the alliance of Russia and China, which threatens the American 1%'s ability to exploit the entire world's economy, what is called corporate globalization. Locally, the News Gazette's long series on those who served reminds us the late George Kalin. It's a, a series that's been going on for some time, uh, uh, interviews with veterans of Iraq and uh, Vietnam in particular. Those who served, the title of the series, reminds us the late George Carlin's remark that the service is a funny name for killing people. The series is an unsubtle justification of the major crimes in our lifetime by what Martin Luther King called the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, the U.S. government. From Vietnam through Afghanistan and Iraq, it profiles military veterans and assumes the justice of America's wars. With a torturer now as head of the CIA, she was called Bloody Gina even by her colleagues, we have the memory of U.S. and we have the memory of U.S. torture from Abu Ghraib to Guantanamo, and undoubtedly much U.S. torture we don't know about. These are secret programs, after all. Secret not from the victims, of course, but from the American people, who would be appalled. Last week, a profile assured us in a sub-headline that, quote, most of an interrogation is just asking a normal question, close quote. But some of the rest includes child rape at Abu Ghraib by American, so by American forces, according to Seymour Hersh and the many abuses by the U.S. military in the, war on terror, in the war on terror. These are not profiled in the series. We might compare it to what Kashama Sawant, a socialist politician, economist, and a member of Socialist Alternative who sits on the Seattle City Council, said about John McCain, which applies also to Barack Obama, who praised McCain this week. Quote, a politician's legacy is a political, not a personal question. An enthusiastic supporter of every imperialist war while in office, John McCain shares responsibility for hundreds of thousands of deaths. 
to whitewash that is to disrespect those who died in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, including Vietnam. This applies, of course, to President Obama as well. You're watching Aware on the Air. We'll begin the notes from our researcher, Dr. No, with an ode to Presidents George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and the continuity of murder's American policy. Because it's murder by numbers, one, two, three, it's as easy to learn as your ABC. Murder by numbers, one, two, three, it's as easy to learn as your ABC. Now you can join the ranks of the illustrious in history's great dark hall of fame. All our greatest killers were industrious, at least the ones that we all know by name. But you can reach the top of your profession if you become the leader of the land. For murder is the sport of the elected, and you don't need to lift a finger of your hand. Dr. Noah ascribes this to the police, not the police you see on the streets, but the musical group. Synchronicity in 1983, murder by numbers. Some notes on elections around the world. Uh, there is a overriding theme here, which is the rise of a populist wave in the U.S. and the EU and even elsewhere uh, that is uh, studiously ignored by mainstream media, which does a great deal of studiously ignoring things these days. Let's take the Swedish election, for example. Nationalists gain traction and are criticized for racism for not readily accepting the refugees from the wars that the U.S. is carrying on in the Middle East who have arrived in Sweden. In Brazil, the Supreme Court disqualifies, once again, Lula da Silva for running for president. Lula is still widely supported. He was called one of the most popular Brazilian politicians and called one of the most popular in the world while he was in office. In the U.S., the Democratic National Committee, corporations change on allow, uh, the DNC's change on allowing, disallowing powerful insiders, the so-called superdelegates, to vote in the first round of primary election is far less important than it's being claimed to be. RT, which uh, Russian television uh, as related to the Russian government as the BBC is to the British government, in fact, not so slavishly. RT's Redacted Tonight, a wonderful program of comedy and political satire uh, by Lee Camp, gives us another example of why it's the only comedy news program worth watching, in a scathing review explaining how DNC primaries are rigged to keep out dissident candidates while giving the superdelegates slightly less power. In other words, they'll avoid Bernie Sanders uh, but, uh, and pretend to reform the superdelegate system that the Democrats ran in the last election. In summary, new rules, gives the, new rules give the DNC different means of gaining the same exclusionary ends, according to an article in the publication The Hill. The Democratic National Committee adopted a new rule last Friday aimed at keeping outsider candidates like Senator Bernie Sanders from trying to clinch the Democratic presidential nomination in 2020. The new rule, adopted by the DNC's Rules and Bylaws Committee, requires all Democratic presidential candidates to be a member of the Democratic Party. A presidential candidate running for the Democratic nomination must be a member of the party, accept the Democratic nomination, and run and serve, their phrase, as a member. A new loyalty oath will be required of any would-be candidate, a loyalty to the Democratic Party. A quote that was in the previous article, but seems to have been removed, read, quote, Accomplishments, public writings, and our public statements affirmatively demonstrate that they are faithful to the interests, welfare, and success of the Democratic Party. And this loyalty will be judged by the DNC chair. If that one person says someone is insufficiently loyal, they're out. Remember, the DNC argued to a court that they have the right even to rig their primaries. The new rule 
state parties are now required to accept absentee votes rather than requiring caucuses voters, caucus voters to be physically present to support candidates at these events, obviously making it easier to manipulate those caucuses. Redacted tonight's Lee Camp explains, quote, so what's wrong with accepting absentee votes in the caucuses? Well, with caucuses, you actually have to show up and listen to arguments about the candidates. This favors exciting populist candidates. It favors supporters who can go in there and say, this is why I support so-and-so, and this is why it's really important that you do too. No one was doing that for Hillary. So Bernie Sanders won the caucus states against Hillary Clinton. But if absentee ballots are counted, this means A, absentee voters can't be convinced to change their minds, B, caucuses are tougher to rig the number because it's all public, the people are standing there, and C, because of the complexity of caucuses plus absentee voting, this is likely to push caucus states towards switching to primaries, and primaries are held on black box computer voting machines which favor the establishment. Censorship plays to establishment candidates. Bernie Sanders received very little mainstream coverage. Trump received 23 times as much as Sanders. Hillary got 10 times as much as Sanders. Bernie Sanders' success came on social media. To prevent a candidate perceived as being anti-establishment, which Sanders, by the way, firmly was not, particularly on war, from doing this again, one pushes the dominant social media services to censor that candidate's voice via shadow banning, delaying their posts, deranking their posts, not informing subscribers of their posts, and outright canceling their accounts for a few days to achieve this. And you get away with this, of course, because this is not government censorship. This is censorship by the social media company, companies uh, like Mr. Zuckerberg's operation. Facebook recently announced a new partnership with the Atlantic Council, which has a stellar reputation looking innov innovative solutions to hard problems. That's what they said. The Atlantic Council's board of directors includes General Wesley Clark, General David Petraeus, and Henry Kissinger. Lee Camp rightly described that board as a who's who of neocon and neoliberal oligarchs and war criminals. The Atlantic Council is a uh, propaganda organization pressing for the policies of the last administration on war and the economy. That is, more war and more inequality. Uh, the Atlantic Council is not to be believed. The next item, the Koreas, uh, North and South, leaving the U.S. behind. The U.S. Uh, government is concerned about this indeed and this week blocked plans for a railway between North and South Korea. Why can the U.S. do this? Well, the U.S. Uh, conquered Korea basically in a war in the 1950s and we've run it to our pleasure ever since, uh, South Korea, uh, and uh, until the Trump administration did all we possibly could to isolate North Korea. RT's crosstalk show is back from vacation and getting into multiple issues which highlight, particularly in the extended segment at the end of the show, how the U.S. is being left behind. While the U.S. choices across two administrations, Obama's and Trump's, push China and Russia together, much to the, much to the U.S. chagrin. Recommend this program highly, uh, as Dr. No does. Uh, this is one of the few interesting things on television in regard to politics, and one of the few honest ones. Turning to uh, England, uh, there have been Britain, there are political developments in Britain this last week and so regarding war that um, mirror or uh, represent in various ways uh, some of the most disturbing things that are going on in American politics regarding war. The paramount example is the Russiagate uh, campaign in this country run by the War Party, that's the Democrats, uh, the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, and a good number of other interests uh, connected to um, the defense industries. The War Party in this country uh, is running Russiagate to maintain 
the war provocations against Russia and China. And in Britain, a campaign ostensibly about anti-Semitism against the Labour Party, and particularly its anti-war leader, uh, is doing essentially the same thing. The parallel is worthwhile for us to, as it were, see ourselves uh, reflected in the mirror of British politics. Two months ago, members of Parliament in Britain reported that UK spies had been complicit in hundreds of human rights abuses. One month ago, the Foreign Office Minister Alan Duncan, Duncan had 60 days to decide on this matter, and that deadline passed Monday, last Monday. Whether the UK citizens actually performed the torture directly is not important. That is what the UK citizens had done in the context of America's war in the Middle East. They knew what was going on. They used information gleaned through torture, and they had a hand in rendition. That is the American notion of kidnapping. What of the culpability of former Prime Minister Tony Blair? Human rights barrister Peter Herbert Obey was interviewed and had this to say. Uh, RT asked, so are you saying the likes of Jack Straw, who's a minister in, in uh, Blair's government, and Tony Blair should be held to account and not actually intelligence services because they're the ones obviously passing on the authorization? Obey says, there's an argument in international criminal law that if you have command responsibility for your staff and you knew or ought to have known what was happening, then you are guilty in a, in a sense of crimes against humanity. He's talking about torture. So it depends how far the evidence, go, evidence goes up the tree. But there is a possibility, certainly, that would include the political masters who must have known and must have asked the question at some point on a common sense basis. How was this information derived? On what basis was it obtained? Who did it come from? Was it reliable? Those questions must have been answered at some point by security chiefs in this country, UK, and an explanation either the ministers did not care or in a sense they were told, either of which may make them liable under international criminal law under crimes against humanity. That's for their participation in the torture campaign the US uh, uh, was guilty of in Iraq and Afghanistan. Doesn't the Chilcot inquiry, this is a uh, parliamentary committee uh, in Britain. Doesn't the Chilcot inquiry suggest to you that no political figure would ever be brought to account for anything like that? Uh, that committee ended up with a report that said mistakes are made, but we're not going to talk too much about by whom. Obi re re remarks, the Chilcot inquiry is obviously historical, a matter of history now. He means it's capable of being ignored. It does not necessarily mean in the current climate far more serious things or just as serious matters will again be dealt with in the same manner. A different judge may take a wholly different view and the evidence which comes out may be a whole lot more damning. In other words, the ability of uh, the uh, parliament to sweep under the rug the torture and illegal war that the uh, uh, Blair government was involved in is absolutely parallel to the Obama administration sweeping under the rug the torture and the illegal war that the Bush government was involved with. You're watching Aware on the Air. We're talking about American war making and its related issues, uh, many of them economic. U.S. anti-Chinese trade tariffs part of the general campaign of the U.S. to retard the economic development of Eurasia for the benefit of the American 1%, the U.S. anti-Chinese trade tariffs are, paradoxically, spurring investment in Chinese businesses as people increasingly work without the U.S. Money that would formerly go into American businesses has, to the dismay of the Trump administration, flowed into Chinese business. We might look at the other side, at poverty. Uh, only one of the few places that covered the news from the national prison strike uh, last month uh, is blackagendareport.com. I recommend it highly, uh, extremely good commentary on the, all the issues we talk about here 
at Aware on the Air. Uh, they also include uh, uh, new evidence that lead exposure, exposure increases crime, uh, having mental effects on those exposed to lead, known for a long time that too much lead uh, is very bad for the brain. What does this tell us about what's to come in Flint, Michigan? Or what of residents in cities where lead paint crumbles off of houses, lands in the yard, gets picked up by people in their own yards and transferred into the home when they go inside? We know this happens and is a major source of lead poisoning in children because they play in their yards. Uh, the uh, uh, deleterious effects of lead uh, were so obvious a generation ago that much effort was made to remove lead from paint uh, and from surfaces that uh, particularly children might come into contact with, but uh, now we put it in the water. A similar case, once again in Britain, how building codes, materials design, and class come together. Emergency measures research the post-Grenfell Towers fire. Uh, the Grenfell Tower investigations pointed out that ex combustible exterior cladding on this uh, high-rise uh, apartment helped rapidly spread the June 14, 2017 fire. The fire started with a malfunctioning fridge freezer unit and ended up burning the entire building in which 72 people died. The point of this is that it's not an isolated case of what the British government has failed to do in normal safety measures uh, for housing, particularly for the poor. Research on other building materials has uncovered that at least 117 blocks of apartments across England use window insulation, which is known to be combustible. They save money that way, hey? Eh? Previous building fires in 2009 and 1999 involved known combustible materials. Who's likely to live in these homes? People who are unlikely to be able to afford to replace the building materials poor and mid-income families, and without significant redesigns of the ways in which windows are manufactured in the UK to use different frames that allow for windows to be removed or fully broken out in the event of a fire, it's unlikely the extant windows will be replaced. The family who suffered deaths, the families who suffered deaths from the Grenfell Towers fire lost some of the money intended for them. Kensington and Chelsea council worker, uh, the local government uh, official uh, named McDonough, admitted pocketing over 60,000 uh, pounds, almost $100,000, of the survivor's fund and spending it on herself. Trips to Dubai and spa treatments, for instance. She was in charge of controlling the access to that money and used her access to bypass checks to make sure the money was spent properly. This fraud will undoubtedly be raised again as people express their justifiable distrust of the system that allowed a minor appliance fire to burn down the building and now rob them of money intended to ease their suffering. Uh, it's only interesting that the British government, uh, with its uh, social traditions in fact stronger than ours, uh, is embarrassed by this tragedy. 72 people dead and the survivors uh, robbed. Turning to Russiagate, remember when Russian collusion was considered a good thing? It was the Clinton administration. U.S. releases secret transcripts of Clinton-Yeltsin conversations. Yeltsin was the president of Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. U.S. has released this week secret transcripts of Clinton-Yeltsin conversations, nearly 600 pages of memos and transcripts documenting dozens of personal exchanges and telephone conversations between President Clinton, President Bill Clinton, and President Yeltsin were made public by the Clinton Presidential Library in Little Rock, Arkansas last month, rather quietly, actually. We get more confirmation showing that Russian collusion is not new, and the Russiagate nonsense we see now is even more clearly to provide excuses for Mrs. Clinton losing a rigged election. From the just-released just transcripts, 
I, I, I have to believe that this is verbatim. President Yeltsin says, Bill, for my election campaign, I urg urgently need for Russia a loan of two and a half billion dollars. President Clinton, I'll check on this with the IMF and with some of our friends and see what can be done. Clinton also helped Yeltsin with a heart operation. The Clintons visited Yeltsin and shopped together. And meanwhile, the Clinton administration moved rapidly to try to reduce Russia to an economic dependency, uh, a third world country controlled by outside capital. Uh, the reversal came only when Vladimir Putin became president of Russia in succession, in succession to Yeltsin. Uh, and the reason Putin is so cordially hated by the American ascendancy, and particularly the Clintons, is that he reversed this relationship, or, well, reverse is a little strong, that he uh, destroyed this relationship of economic dependency that the Clinton administration worked so hard to arrange uh, in Russia during the Yeltsin presidency. The notion that the fall of the Soviet Union meant that Russia could be entirely dominated by American ca capital turned out not to be the case, largely owing to the efforts of Vladimir Putin. And as a result, he is indeed cordially hated by the American ascendancy. More lies about Russiagate. The Department of Homeland Security created a deceptive tale about Russia u hacking U.S. voting sites. Add this one to the pile of stories that fall apart on serious analysis. Gareth Porter is interviewed about his story on RT, looked into the Department of Homeland Security's secret report, which claimed Russia was potentially, potentially, targeting websites that could be electorally related. DHS leaked this information to NBC in September 2016 and didn't tell NBC it was a possibility, but let NBC believe that this actually had occurred. It hadn't, and there was no proof that it had occurred. On September 29, 2016, a few weeks after the hacking of election-related re election websites in Illinois and Arizona, ABC News carried a sensational headline, quote, Russian hackers targeted nearly half of states' voter registration systems successfully infiltrated four, close quote. The story itself reported that more than 20 state election systems had been hacked and four states had been breached by hackers su suspected of working for the Russian government. The story cited only sources, quote, knowledgeable, close quote, about the matter, indicating that those who were pushing the story were eager to hide the institutional origins of the information, that is, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. But we now know that the Illinois and Arizona break-in attempts were by criminals with interest in the voters' personal information, not in altering election data such as vote counts. The DHS falsely claimed that the IP addresses involved in those acts were also involved in other breaches of security and that Russians were at the heart of all these breaches. Arizona electoral officials challenged the claim about what happened to their system, and the DHS admitted the breach had nothing to do with altering the election records, but then the DHS claimed the breach was targeting the Arizona Public Library. It wasn't. But this story, by the way, there was no such uh, uh, careful investigation in, in Illinois. We could ask the Illinois government about why they weren't as watchful as Arizona was about this fake attempt to prove Russia meddling uh, in the election. You're watching Aware on the Air. We have a couple other points to make uh, this evening. Uh, the next one is about exploiting children. UK British Home Secretary Sajid Javid announced plans for a government inquiry to look into what allows organized gangs in Britain to sexually exploit children, what are being called cultural drivers, with particular focus on the ethnic origins of these games, these gangs. There appears to be suspicions that gangs of Pakistani origin are targeted. 
we were told we're told there will be no no go zones pulling all the stops in the investigations that is the investigation will look at all British communities but a peculiar concentration perhaps on the immigrant communities the Sun reports the Sun the British publication hard to call it a newspaper the Sun reports about a Labour Party MP Sarah Champion quote British Pakistani men are raping and exploiting white girls and it's time we faced up to it close quote that's the headline in the Sun Relatedly, one wonders if this has anything to do with the bad press the UK government has recently received about its own exploitation of children when the public learned about child spies. Children under 18 years old, 18 years of age in Britain known as CHIS, C-H-I-S, covert human intelligence sources in the British government's term. They're recruited and put into dangerous situations on cases where the government argues only a child could help them gather evidence. Current law requires periodic re-registration for each child spy after every month, and UK police want to extend the time to four months before having to renew the registration. This is quite amazing. This is what's happening in the UK where underage uh, subjects are being used as spies on primarily, apparently, immigrant groups. Sticking with Britain, so to speak, uh, we'll turn to the question of Brexit, the uh, conclusion by the British electorate that they want to leave the European Union. A recent poll indicates that if Brexit goes through in March of 2019 as planned, 47% of Scots would be in favor of independence, that is independence from the UK, independence from the United Kingdom, uh, separation from England, and 43% would be against it. Scotland's first minister, basically the governor, uh, says, the poll that I think is most interesting today is the one that shows that as people look at the prospect of a hard, perhaps no deal Brexit, that a majority of people in Scotland are actually saying they would choose the alternative of independence, independence from England. 62% of Scots voted against Brexit, Brexit, that is, they voted to remain in the European Union. The poll, this poll for independence is a record high. Uh, there are complex questions here about whose interests are being served by these various arrangements. Uh, there is a very good argument that the Brexit vote, the, the vote to leave the EU, was in fact in the interests of the British working class, uh, and it was the um, British ascendancy that wanted to stay with the Union, uh, with the European Union, and its neoliberal and even new conservative policies. The rejection of those policies indicated a vote against Brexit. But the situation in Scotland was more difficult uh, because of Scotland's subservience uh, to England. Uh, and the uh, independence, in a certain sense, that membership in the European Union granted to Scotland. Uh, they want to maintain what degree of independence they had, and that means to a good number of Scots uh, a separation from England. Turn to the question of WikiLeaks. Uh, the Julian, an associate, a close associate of Julian Assange, the head of WikiLeaks, and the author of a book entitled Information Security for Journalists, uh, Aryan Camphaus, has disappeared, according to friends and colleagues. He was last seen in Bodo, Norway, on August 20th. Aryan Camphaus is a Dutch information technology security expert and an avid hiker. He was staying in a Norwegian hotel in the Norwegian town of Bodo, and he had plans to take a 10-hour train journey, journey from Bodo to Trondheim, then fly from Trondheim to Amsterdam on August 22nd. Norwegian police are informed and have started an investigation. Assange is still in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Ecuadorian President Moreno has said he wants Assange out and has moved out some of the furniture from Assange's home. Camphouse is co-author of Information Security for Journalists, 
you can download the book as a matter of fact I'll put the link on the uh, uh, on the aware uh, Facebook page uh, it's a book that checks that uh, gives an account of um, the things that are being said about uh, uh, information technology in the news and translates them uh, into plain language. Education. American student loan default rate is 34.5%, and colleges are responding by offering income share agreements where students pay part of their future salary to the school after graduation. We used to call this indentured servitude. Now it's known by other names at about 100 schools so far, more coming soon, including Purdue, which was the first to offer its ISA, income share agreement, they'll share a little of your income, uh, called Back a Boilermaker. <laughs> how would you like to be in the, in, in the department that has to make up names for these things about how colleges and uh, the government is to get money about of people who want to go to college? In civilized countries, uh, in Europe and Latin America, people who want to go to college, if they get in, get to go to college. Uh, and it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, that used to be the case in Britain, too, but was changed by the Blair government. Norwich University, a private military college in Vermont, and Lackawanna College in Pennsylvania offer their new affordability initiative. <laughs> which is said to expand access and opportunity. Once again, it's a scheme whereby you give them money <laughs> from money that you make after college, uh, and uh, everybody is happy. Clarkson University offers the Lewis Income Share Agreement. You know, it seems to me if someone comes to you and says they want to share your income, uh, you might ask for maybe a better justification. Uh, they. Clarkson University claims there are 500 contracts with students enrolled in Back a Boiler who have received funding total six million. Well, perhaps on the grounds that uh, this is, of course, an investment for the college because it receives that, it receives payments on that money on that six million. In Britain, once again, our parallels work here. Uh, a UK student loans company is accused of spying on vulnerable students and denying them their next installments in spite of this uh, after graduation payback agreement. It's not clear precisely how the loans company, student loan company or SLC, is spying on students. The allegation is that SLC is somehow using social media posts determine which students are estranged from their parents and too poor to fight the SLC. Then the SLC claimed the poor students' accounts are in need of review. SLC policy says that during the review period, which lasts an arbitrarily long time, SLC doesn't pay the student any money. Therefore, the poor student with no family falls behind on tuition, fees, rent, etc., and comes closer to dropping out. One interviewed anonymous student said he did drop out and is living with friends. There are allegations the SLC somehow hacked students' social media accounts in order to spy on them. But it's possible the students posted publicly and the SLC is reading what the students publish to the world. Or the SLC has a relationship with popular social media companies to get data on user accounts. What is clear is that this is a direct consequence of privatizing and commercializing education in the UK. When the UK went the way of the US for a higher education, they took on all of the predictable outcomes where the poor find it harder to get a college education, as in the US. If education were free for all, funded by taxpayers, as it is in Germany, France, even Brazil, uh, there might be no need for the SLC in the first place, and thus whatever they're doing to poor estranged students would not be an issue. You're watching uh, Aware on the Air. We're talking about war and related issues, uh, and unfortunately we need to talk about murdered journalists. Three Russian journalists were killed, found dead in a bullet-riddled car, in the Central African Republic at the end of July. CNN was quick to ask an interviewee if this was a state-connected execution carried out by the Russian military. 
The New York Times, CBS, and Washington Post echoed the same narrative. Their investigation of mercenaries with close ties to the Kremlin got them killed. Unfortunately, these reports don't come with evidence to back their conclusions. It is the Central African Republic where the U.S. has been moiling about for some time uh, to keep the war going. Screenshots of a group chat log between the murdered gen journalists, a couple of producers, and their boss from their reporting organization have surfaced. It's not clear where this information came from, but it tells a different story. The reporters were ill-prepared to handle what faced them in the CAR, the Central African Republic, and weren't able to bribe or slip their way into the guarded facilities they needed to get to complete their investigation. Their plans indicate they plan to fake to print fake UN credentials, which is illegal. They plan to use tourist visas to get into the CAR, then conduct their journalism once inside, which is a abuse of the visas. And they knew they had no accreditation, and they had no contact with people on the inside after arriving in the Central African Republic. No contact with their fixer, no itinerary, no contact with their English translator. Uh, and there is a um, summary of the uh, conversation of these reporters uh, in the uh, article on the uh, AWARE Facebook page. Um, what we're dealing with here is the immense involvement of the American military in Africa. Uh, America has troops in all but one, or perhaps two, it's not clear, two African countries. Uh, American military in Africa are claiming that they're there to counter Russian and Chinese influence. Russian and Chinese influence tends largely to be uh, economic and social. Part of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, BRI, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, and includes such things as building roads and dams. Uh, China and Russia send engineers to Africa. Uh, the U.S. sends the military. And the U.S. Uh, does nothing to end the internecine conflicts that are taking place in Central Africa. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese uh, do because, of course, their economic projects are involved. Uh, Dr. No, our researcher, says, I'm tempted to file this issue under Russiagate because CNN and all likely report on this in order to cast a bad light on Russia. They're so desperate to make Russiagate seem significant, despite a recent poll in this country that indicates overwhelming indifference to the Russiagate story. And to make Russiagate appear rooted in fact, which it isn't, even nearly two years in, corporate media needs dirt on anything connected to Russia so they can attempt to salvage the Russiagate stories. Therefore, these chat log screenshots are interesting to report on both because, they're mur because they murdered journalists, which is sad in itself, and because the story undermines the corporate media's Russiagate narrative. If Russiagate explains how Trump became the U.S. president, Russiagate requires skilled and <laughs> clever Russian infiltrators who carried out nefarious plans against Hillary Clinton's campaign. We don't see such skilled Russians in Africa. These reporters don't appear to have thought through whatever plan they had, nor they seem to have carried out a plan well. There seems to have been no backups in place in the Central African Republic awaiting the journalists' arrival. RT's report on this creates the impression that it wasn't difficult for people in the Central African Republic to find and eventually kill these journalists. Uh, the suggestion, and it is only that, is that the Russian involvement in uh, Africa uh, is not military and political, but as Russia contends, economic and social. We turn now to the question of censorship. NBC stopped an investigative story on Harvey Weinstein, which would have substantiated the claims against him that he mistreated the actors working in his movies, including allegations of multiple forms of sexual harassment. Since then, over 70 women have claimed as much about Weinstein, and he now stands accused and charged with rape and other offenses in New York where the trial is pending. Does this mean that those who back Me Too now distrust NBC, owned by Comcast, 
and we should expect social media posts to that effect? Perhaps, perhaps not. Censorship uh, in the media extends even to this issue. The Peace Award reminds one to examine the past with more scrutiny. In line with President Obama's visit to town and his Nobel Peace Prize, awarded for unclear reasons, perhaps for not being G.W. Bush, comes up as RT reviews another war criminal who received a Nobel Peace Prize and further demonstrated how the Nobel Peace Prize is more an elite's award for carrying out the 1%'s agenda. Nobel Committee allows Aung San Suu Kyi to keep her 1991 Nobel Peace Prize. In 2012, she told reporters she did not know if the Rohingya could be regarded as Burmese citizens, and she didn't condemn violence against the Rohingya and denied that Muslims in Myanmar were subject to systematic force removal, that is, ethnic cleansing. Uh, the situation has expanded in those days. Uh, the humorous Tom Lehrer said years ago that political satire was impossible after Henry Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and he'd not even heard of Barack Obama or Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have a number of other matters to mention. I will put these on the uh, Facebook page for Aware on the Air, which you've been watching. It's presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. We are recording in the studios of Urbana Public Television on September 4th in the 36th week of 2018, another week in which the world can see the most extensive global terrorism is U.S. worldwide war making. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Liggett and Crofton and Coleman. Thanks to him also, this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. Our show tonight was largely written by Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson, seen No's notes on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air, along with links to articles referred to tonight. There's a demonstration against Obama's speech on campus this Friday. Karen Aram of Aware writes, Former President Barack Obama will receive the Paul H. Douglas Award for Ethics in Government from the University of Illinois at Fallinger Auditorium on the UIUC campus on Friday, September 7th at 11 a.m. He will lecture on authoritarian politics and the responsibilities of citizenship. I can't make this up. In response and protest, a coalition of local peace and social justice groups plan to voice criticism of Obama's policies and of the appropriateness of this award, beginning at 10 a.m. in front of, that is on the north side, of Fallinger. Informed speakers will address Obama's war-making policies, especially in Libya and Syria, as well as his drone assassination program. His support, even before becoming president, for the bailout of Wall Street bankers rather than homeowners, and its continuation of neoliberal economic policies that continue to devastate working families throughout his administration. His deportation policies, which preceded those of the current administration, uh, and his betrayal of campaign promises made to the labor movement in general regarding pro-union card check, Employer Free Choice Act legislation in particular. Speakers representing a variety of organizations will have an opportunity to counter the university administration promoted propaganda inherent in this visit, award, and lecture. And to do so in a truthful and dignified manner that attracts attention to the popular desire for peace and justice and away from the cult of personality that is inherent in such a visit by a primary, primary representative of American and global ruling elites." Close quote. There's an open AWARE meeting this coming Sunday, 5 to 6 p.m. at Hammerhead Coffee at University Avenue at Wright Street on the northeast edge of the campus. And finally, AWARE honors those who re reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about, but Americans don't, Manning, Assange, Snowden, and others, who are truth-tellers persecuted by the U.S. government, including particularly our liberal Democratic Senator Durbin, a shill for the Russiagate propaganda. Now this is Carl Estabrook for members and friends of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night.
and good luck.